So everyone fails at landscape photography sometimes, and this week I had an epic fail. More on that shortly. In this video, I'm gonna talk about the seven failures that I see both beginners and pros make, and I'm gonna show you the simplest way to avoid them, making you get better photos. Morning, everybody. Fantastic to see you all again. Well, I've had a pretty epic couple of weeks. I've been lucky enough to go to Svalbard, East Greenland, and then finally, on the volcano where I took this photo here with my drone. I was flying my drone and I took some amazing photos, went twice, it was really quite scary flying over the volcano and I messed up, really big time messed up. Uh, I basically couldn't focus, then switched to manual focus, thought I'd nailed it and left it in manual focus. And that meant that when I switched lenses, I thought it went back to autofocus. It didn't, I didn't really understand my equipment enough. I was messing about with it above a volcano. It wasn't the, <laughs> the nicest time to be playing with your, your settings on your drone, not really knowing what, what I was doing to try and sort this problem out. And it ended up that 80% of my photos were out of focus. And that's the first thing that leads to failure that we do as photographers. And that's just trusting your equipment, trust that your equipment's just gonna do the right thing. You've got to understand your equipment and I'm going to talk a bit more about that soon but it's so important not to just trust the equipment you've got but to test it and to know how it works so know how to do things like set exposure set focus you know make sure that the, the white balance um, is is correct uh, if you especially if you're shooting something like jpeg it's something that i do a lot <laughs> and it's not just something that I've just done once or twice. I've failed doing that quite a lot. I've learned my lesson here, and that's why failure is good sometimes, because if you do fail, and in digital photography you can fail quite quickly, then you can learn and improve. And it's really important to make that mistake before you wanna take an epic landscape. So the next thing is <laughs> related to that first one, but I think it's really, really important, and I've started to do this a lot more in the last sort of five or six years. And that's just, just to make sure that you check focus um, and check things like exposure whilst you're on location, whilst you can do something about it. You should be able to have a number of batteries. You've got a digital camera. Usually in landscape photography, you've got a bit of time. It's not difficult just to look through the eyepiece and zoom in on your photo and just check that it's pin sharp and then you can take it again. The worst thing is getting all the way home from an epic trip like I did and then finding out it's not in focus. Now, that's another thing where I didn't really understand my equipment because I didn't know how to quickly go in and check photos that I'd take and zoom in on them and check them in focus on my controller. And that's something that I'm definitely gonna learn now. Now, if you enjoy this short video I'm making today, then please give it a like. It really helps my channel. It really helps the algorithm let other people find this video. And if you're not subscribed and 50% of the people that watch the videos aren't, then please consider subscribing. Okay, the next thing is choosing the wrong focal length for something. So. This is a really easy mistake to make. So quite often I see this made um, when we're on workshops um, and it's something I've done a lot in the past, especially in woodland photography actually, where you're shooting a scene and you wanna get everything in, so you shoot wide angle. So you might shoot say 24 millimeters, but sometimes it's better to step back a little bit and zoom in. And that sounds a bit counterintuitive, but basically by doing that, you'll get rid of some of the, the things that are not really interested in the photo at the top and bottom. So this is a good example. This photo here is a good example of something that works at 24 millimeters. Might have been a bit wider than that uh, when I was in, the, in, in Luskintyre. I took this as really interesting sky. There's a really nice diagonal in the foreground, which adds to the sort of openness of the image and it works at a really wide angle. The next image, quite similar, but doesn't work at a wide angle. And what I should have done is move to the left a little bit to get more of the mountain in on the right hand side and zoom in just to focus more on these waves because the top and bottom of this image just aren't interesting and that would have given a much better composition. So being able to know when you should zoom and quite often people take shots that are too wide. You know, usually you wanna zoom more than you think and because you're, you know, thinking, oh, I wanna get these things on the outside in, then you're going too wide, so it's better to just step back. Super simple um, mistake to make, and uh, and it really does re result in a failure in your images and, and something that's, you know, a failure that, that, that can be easily avoided. I've done a video here on it, so go and check it out, um, all about focal lengths and choosing the right focal lengths. And um, yeah, let me know what you think. 
also I'd be really interested to know what, what your failures have been, you know, what you found out, how, how the hard way may be. Let me know your stories in the comments below. I'd be really keen to know. The next one is all about wasting the foreground in an image or just foreground that just doesn't work in an image. I see this all the time in photos. Um, again, I've made it. Here's one that I did five or six years ago. This is a woodland image where the foreground is just not that interesting, really. So it doesn't add anything to the image. Whereas this image here, the foreground's way more interesting. It's got the same amount of mid-ground and far ground in it, but the foreground's way more interesting, as is this one here with the fern. So if you're gonna use a foreground, if you're gonna use a wide angle lens and put the foreground in it, then that foreground's got to be interesting. Usually it's gotta be repeating patterns or some really interesting structure that's leading your eye through into the image. The next one is similar to the first one, but it's all about knowing things in your camera, the things that your camera can do that you might not know about. I guarantee there's a lot of them. Um, not everybody reads the whole manual. I certainly don't. One of the things I found out a few years ago was it really it was really easy if with setting up on my Z7 to be able to, to handhold it without a, a tripod and just press the shutter down and it would take three or five exposures in quick, super quick succession, um, bracketed. In the past, I'd usually had it on my tripod and I'd taken one at a time. I didn't know it would automatically take them in quick succession. It sounds really daft. You think, wow, how could you not know that? But there's loads of other things. Um, you know, maybe you don't know how to auto um, focus stack. So can most cameras now have focus stacking automatically. It's really useful to do. It doesn't stack the photos for you, but it takes them um, a, a set number of focus points. So you don't have to think where am I going to focus. Really easy feature to be able to use. The other one is just being able to review your camera 100% without moving your eye from the eyepiece. So if you're taking a shot, pressing a button or setting a button that just plays the photo back and zooms it into 100% so you can check focus. Again, saves time, makes it really easy to do. If something's easy to do, you're more likely to do it, which means it's gonna lead in less failures, less failed photos, super useful. Okay, the penultimate one, and this is one that I um, did shooting polar bears when I was in Greenland. It was quite dark, um, believe it or not, in 24 hour daylight, but we had an overcast day. Uh, and I wanted to shoot a fast shutter speed. So I shot at a really high ISO. And uh, uh, the mistake, the failure that I see people make is shooting at low ISOs or, uh, you know, and compromising shutter speed. A sharp image is way better than um, a noisy image. So you, you don't really mind having a bit of noise if it's sharp, but having you know, shooting at ISO 64 if your polar bear's blurred is just not a good idea. So usually what I do if I'm shooting wildlife um, or anything where I want to set have a set shutter speed is if I, I, I either just do it on shutter pr priority and just do an auto ISO so that it will automatically um, increase the ISO maybe a thousandth of a second, which is what I was doing when I was shooting the polar bear. In fact, I think I was shooting at a sixteen hundredth of a second. I'll show you the shot here. I'm going to show more of these shots. In, in a few weeks time when I've got a chance to go through all my footage. But yeah, shooting polar bears, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> I blew my mind. Um, we didn't get super close to them, but I think I got some pretty, pretty good shots. And if I hadn't failed doing that in the past, I probably wouldn't have known about it. I need to just get another photo up here just to show you something for the final one. And this is this photo here. So this is a, a photo that I took in Yosemite. Now, I have to be honest, I, I've... I've made this a little bit better than what it was because I was so embarrassed, but this was a, a photo that I over-edited. And I thought, I wonder if I've over-edited any photos because I, th I think this is a mistake that I used to make. And I couldn't find it. And then I was going back all the way to Yosemite. I think this was in 2011. And I found this shot. W when the sky is, is darker than some of the things that shouldn't be darker and in the foreground, you know that you've over-edited. I see it quite a lot in photos when I've judged photo competitions. Um, over-editing is is such a big thing and there's a difference between a lot of editing and over editing. If you look at people like Mas Peter Iverson, Michael Shainblum, um, Daniel Corden, they're all people that edit a lot. They do a lot of editing in their photos, but their photos don't look over edited. So don't think that you need to overdo things. Often natural is better. When I redid this photo and, and did it this way, I feel like it's better. It's more in my style as well, but subtlety, is important. 
um, in editing. So maybe go back through your photos think, have I over edited that? Because, you know, it might be something you can improve on. And if you're looking to improve your editing, then I have some masterclass courses. I've got masterclass one, masterclass two, and I've also got a Lightroom masterclass, which is for basics, you know, if you're just getting into Lightroom. And I'm doing an offer at the moment for all those courses for 40% off. There's a discount code below. If you're interested, then that's for the whole of August. So if you're looking to improve your photography, then maybe go and check out um, my masterclass. I know that thousands of people get a lot of benefit from it. We've got a Facebook group as well. And for the first 10 people that sign up, I'll edit your photo. So if you sign up, um, then uh, in, in August, the first 10, I'll edit the photo. Okay, that's it. Short video this week. Thanks ever so much for watching. And until next Sunday when we'll be in Svalbard, I think, doing maybe some street photography or maybe he might be shooting polar bears. Thanks ever so much for watching. Until next Sunday, bye. <laughs>